is um, Bruce Zellner. And Bruce has spent the 30 years in research and consulting positions, first in Minneapolis at the Institute of Interdisciplinary Studies, then as a consultant to the state of Wisconsin and a researcher at the University of Wisconsin. Before retirement in 2000, he spent six years as a staff researcher in the Department of Family Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin and the University of Illinois School of Medicine at Rockford. In retirement, he continues to do research on a number of statistical problems in diagnostic testing and to publish an occasional article with some of the former colleagues as co-authors. We're happy to have him here. Please join me in welcoming Bruce Zeller. Well, thank, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, this is a new area of interest for me, and uh, I hope I've learned enough to, to be interesting and informative to you. Uh, the topic of income inequality has gotten a lot of attention recently, and uh, this is mostly due to a book by uh, Thomas Piketty, and uh, uh, there was a previous GMAL lecture on, I just want to ask how many people attended Peter Radford's lecture. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take a, a, a slightly different uh, perspective on, on the same issue. And I'm going to begin by laying out sort of the entire perspective that I'm going to take. This way, as I get into the slides, if I lose my way, you'll hopefully remember where it was I was supposed to be going. <laughs> Uh, since at least the beginning of the 20th century, the U.S. has led the world in technological innovation and adaptation, raising the productivity of its workers, and in particular, workers with more educational, uh, with, with more education. Now, economists call this kind of technological change skill-biased, and while it raises productivity of labor in general, it, it does so more for workers with more education. Uh, although you might have expected that the uh, uh, earnings of better educated workers would rise going forward from the beginning of the 20th century, uh, in fact, that did not happen. Quite the reverse happened. The earnings of better educated workers declined relative to unskilled workers. And income equality increased in the United States. Uh, this process continued up until the 70s. Um, then, sometime after the 70s, towards the end of that decade, uh, the earnings of better educated workers began to increase relative to unskilled workers. In fact, the earnings of less educated workers uh, stagnated and in some cases began a decline, an absolute decline in earnings. Uh, the real earnings of a male high school dropout in 2012 was absolutely lower than it had been in the uh, 70s and lower than it had been in 1963. And that's assuming full-time, full-year employment. Uh, during that same period from 63 to 2012, the real earnings of a worker with more than a BA, so a master's with PhD or a professional degree, uh, nearly doubled over the same, 40, um, same time period. So the question is, why this long period of growing income equality? And then towards the end of the 70s, this growing apart, uh, this increasing income inequality and I think uh, an important part of the answer is the behavior of our educational system. From 1890, and perhaps even earlier, but I, I couldn't find any data, uh, the US educational system led the world in educating and raising the educational attainment of each succeeding cohort of children. And this process continued up until 1970, and at that time, the United States had the best educated workforce in the world. 
Then it stopped. It stopped quite dramatically and suddenly, and I have some slides to show you that illustrate that. Uh, it stopped, and soon after, wages or earnings started to grow apart. Better educated people started to really make a lot more money than less educated people. Now, um, this, um, now I think that much of the increased income inequality that affects our society today arises from this failure of our educational system. And it is not from this perspective that the 1% has experienced such outside gains that you hear, hear about as that so many others will have, exper have experienced almost no gain at all. This is a, a major factor in accounting for the uh, sharp increase in the share of the uh, income garnered by the top 1%. Now here's what everyone has been talking about. Could you? Yes. This um, slide shows the share of income of total income for the top 1% in black, for the next lowest 4% in blue, and for the next lowest 5% of, of households in red. And this is a percent of households, or I should say tax units. And this is based on tax data. And this is what uh, Piketty's uh, um, been concerned with, uh, and Emmanuel Says and others in the, in the United States. You can see the share, uh, and on, on the, on the x-axis are, are the um, years. And you can see that starting in this uh, late 70s, the income share of the top 1% of households begins to climb. And today, they uh, garner about 20% of total income. The top 1% gets 20%. <coughs> and the reason for this very jagged um, movement, I imagine it's because realized capital gains are included here. And capital gains, you know, are going to jump around with the stock market. For the next lowest 4% of households, you can see their increasing share of total income is, is relatively modest. In fact, it's about 30% over the whole period. And for the next 5% down, so it's the 90, 90, 90th percentile to 95th percentile, uh, it's, it's less than 10% increase in share. So the story is really about the 1%. Now, um, Now, the next slide shows the, thank you, the next slide shows the uh, annual growth rate of uh, real, so it's adjusted for inflation, average household income by the quintile of the household. So this is the bottom 20% of households, the next 20% of households in terms of household income, the middle, the fourth, and the top 20% of households. And then uh, in this slide, we also can see the top 5%. And this is the rate of growth of income over two periods, 1947 to 73 in the light gray, and 73 to 2005 in the slightly darker gray shade. And you can see a very dramatic difference between these two periods. In the 47 to 73 period, the poorest 20% of households in the United States grew at a rate of 3% a year. In the next period, 73 to 2005, this, the lowest 20% of households, income barely grew at all over, over a 32-year uh, period. In, the earlier period, you can see there's a growing equality of income because the poorest 
are experiencing the greatest income growth. The top 5% are experiencing actually the smallest uh, uh, rate of growth. I'll get to the, these blue things later. Um, now, I calculated this for the top 1%. And they experienced very little, econ uh, very little economic, very little growth in, the, in their household incomes. It was a little over 1% a year uh, for the early period, 47 to 73. And in the post-73 period, they experienced a growth rate of 3%, which is what the poorest had experienced in the pre-73 uh, period. So that pretty much all of the increased share of the 1% can be looked at a, 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 as resulting from the abysmal and very inequitable growth of incomes of the rest of the society. If, if the bottom if everyone had retained their growth rates of income and the 1% had gone up to the 3% rate of growth that they in fact experienced after 73, we wouldn't even have this as an issue. The reason this is an issue is because the 1% have incomes growing at 3% a year. And here we have this very inequitable pattern of almost zero growth for the poorest and increasing growth rates according to how high your income is. So this is a pattern, the second, the, 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 the post-73 period is clearly a pattern of growing inequality throughout the income distribution. Now uh, I'm just going to mention a little bit just in case this comes up as an issue. This data from which we get this information is from household surveys carried out by the Bureau of the Census. And household surveys are reputed to miss really high income people. Many of them have more than one residence. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why they travel more. Why uh, surveying uh, a sample, this is, um, Probably, this is all from the current population uh, survey, the CPS, and the, uh, the sample size is about 50,000, but the really high-income households have a frequency of about 1 in 10,000. So you're talking about five households. It's easy to miss those five households. So I went to Piketty's data, which is from tax returns and there the rich have to pay taxes. And that they at least have to file a return. And, and I calculated uh, the extent to which this data is, is biased downward for high income households. And I came up with this estimate, and this is my adjustment here. Uh, it's probably an overestimate, uh, and that's what that is. And uh, it, it's not, problematic because you see even with the adjustment the top 20 percent actually have a lower rate of growth of income in the post-73 period. Now the top 5 percent you see the growth rate is increasing and of course for the top 1 percent it goes right to 3.1 3 percent per year increase in income over this period 47 to 73. Um, now, um, I'd like to skip the next slide, keep going, that slide. Now, what's generating this growth in household income in the post-73 period? Uh, this is a slide of weekly, real weekly earnings relative to 1963 for uh, groups of, of workers of different educational attainment. The dark blue are high school dropouts. The red are high school graduates. The sort of greeny beige are high school <coughs> graduates, some college, 
yarns are college graduates, and this uh, light blue are people with more than a bachelor's degree. It's split between men and women, uh, male and female. Um, and we'll get to why that's an important split. And as you can see, from 1979 on onward, there's this growing dispersion in wages. For high school dropouts, you can see the real wage, the real earnings of high school dropouts, this is assuming that they're employed full time <coughs> for a year, is dropping. And by 2012, it's in fact less than it was in 1963. For the uh, um, high school graduates, it's better, it looks like some improvement over 1963, but since 1979, since it's, they've started to diverge, um, they were actually lower than they were in 1979. For people with a high school degree in some college, they are just about back to where they were in 79, so they're pretty much constant. There is now decent growth for people with a college degree and the people who are really doing well, <coughs> almost doubling their earnings uh, compared to 1963, are people with more than a college degree. That's for men. For women, things look a little better. There's the same dispersion of earnings uh, uh, after 1979. And of course, the, the better educated have much higher earnings. But the high school dropouts uh, are actually doing better, or at least no worse than they were in 79, and certainly better than 1963. And the reason women look sort of a little better than men is because women start from a, a, a very disadvantaged position. In, in 1963, there was really a very large uh, wage gap between men and women, a discriminatory wage gap, and that is closing. And because it's closing, women look like they're doing better for the same education. But in absolute level, they're still earning less than men. Um, OK, so why is this happening? Why? Now, up till this point, wages are growing together. I, I won't. I hope you believe me, but I have numbers here to give you. It's, it's hard to get a graph of the earlier period because it's pieced together from different data sources. Uh, but they, they very much uh, it came together. Like in 1915, a college graduate had an earnings 90% higher than, than a uh, high school graduate. By 1950, that gap has come down to only 37% higher. And then Starting in 1963, you see the data here, and certainly by the late 70s, they're starting to really spread out. Okay, can put up the next. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, this is high school, the high school graduation rate, public and private secondary school enrollment and graduation rates, 1890 to 2005. And you can see the high school graduation rate rising. Now, I'm sure that for, to calculate this rate, they must have just taken all the kids who were 14 years of age and treated them as, as, um, uh, uh, as if they were the, the uh, they treated them as the denominator. And, and then four years later, they calculated the numerator, which would be the number of graduates. Because in the early days, uh, some people never even enrolled in high school. Uh, but you can see this little bobble here is World War II. This one is, I think, the Korean War. That, uh, there's, can, can, you, can that be raised? I didn't, I didn't realize. 1890 is in the black part here. Yeah, there, there we go. OK, that's good. Oh, I didn't mean to 
cause that much trouble. No, that's okay. It's there. Okay. Okay, so now you see in 1970, actually it's a couple of years before, it starts in 1968, uh, the graduation rate simply stops growing. And this was the engine of, of sort of the, the US economy. We had this, this virtuous interaction between skill bias, technological change, which still continues to this day. In fact, it, it may have accelerated with the introduction of uh, small computers and cheap, cheap computing power. And this all comes to a sudden stop uh, at the, uh, in the late 60s, and it, it actually starts to fall. Now it picks up a little bit, and I heard recently uh, Arne Duncan on television claiming it had uh, gotten to 80% uh, uh, rate, uh, graduation rate. This is the GED uh, certificate, uh, GED test that people take to get a high school certificate if they pass that. Uh, this was originally uh, uh, developed for vets to take advantage of the GI Bill because some of the vets, remember this squiggled back here, back here and here, um, a number of vets had left high school to go on, uh, uh, to an, uh, um, volunteer uh, for the armed uh, services. And when they came out, they were eligible for the GI Bill, but they didn't have a high school degree. So the GED was uh, ginned up for that purpose. But nowadays, the people who take advantage of this are high school dropouts who after a few years of trying to, to uh, uh, find employment, uh, realize they need more education, they go back, they take the GED exams, they get their certificate. But researchers have found very few go on to college and the economic benefits are not as great as a regular high school uh, diploma. Okay, so this why did this happen? Um, um, well, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, this, this, this sudden stopping of growth of educational attainment. If you could uh, flip to the next slide. This is a, a, a census-based uh, data, and this shows the purport, percentage of 25 to 29-year-olds with a high school degree or more and again, you can see it's growing, 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 and then suddenly it stops and it's flat. Now, this line is 25 years old and over high school degree or more, and it looks like it's still growing. It's, it is growing statistically. It's growing because the people who are passing away were educated in an era when, when educational levels were much lower. If you remember the high school graduation rate thing starts down here in 1890, and by 1920, uh, less than 20% uh, of kids are, are getting a high school degree, and that slowly climbs to, uh, where, to where it, it leveled off in 1970 at about, uh, I think it was about 77%. Um, now this is, the, the lower figure is 25 to 20, 29 year olds with a bachelor's degree or more. And you see the same thing, it's growing, growing, growing. And then it just levels off. And uh, this was in 1977. And if you work it backwards, you'll see it, it, it's consistent with the stopping uh, 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 of growth in the, in the high school graduation rate in 1968. Um, now, the, it'll look like educational attainment is continuing to grow until about 2040, just because the, the elderly people who are passing away were educated in a much earlier era of, of low high school graduation rates. 
Um, now, <clears throat> there is no consensus that I could find on why this happened. Um, let me just show you the next slide because I was looking around for, you know, is, is this uh, uh, got something to do with minority children entering the school system or what? And I found this, if you, if you can, can it be moved over a little bit? Oh, maybe, I'll just tell you what this is. This is uh, um, number of years of schooling at age 35. And I, and I found this and I had a racial breakdown, so I was, you know, this showed what I, wanted it to. It's the same kind of slowing down of educational attainment for 35-year-olds, both black and white. And this is uh, on, on the x-axis, is year of birth, and, and you can see 1950 year of birth. Well, they would have been graduating high school in 1968, just when the graduation rates flatten out. And so we can see the reflection of that in this, uh, uh, this slide, which is number of years of schooling uh, at age 35. And it's, it's at a, about 13 years of schooling, which is not, it's less than college and more than high school. Um, and the, the next slide is uh, from the same source. They broke it out, men and women. And you can see here, for the men, they actually, uh, this starts with the 1948 birth cohort, which it would have been 1966 that they would be ready to graduate high school going forward. And for women, it occurs later. And also women start to grow again earlier than men, but the, these curves sort of flatten out again. So there's no, no uh, uh, bright, happy ending to this. Now, I don't, as I said, I, a lot of researchers are aware that this has happened. Uh, and I can find no consensus about what, what the problem is. M many researchers claim that uh, the high school dropout can't read. So there's no sense making them stay in school. And that the failure is really back in the primary schools. Other researchers find, well, if you mandate an increase in, in, in years required uh, before a, a student can leave, that some of them actually stay in school and uh, you know, they don't become truants. They stay an extra year or two. They do complete the schoolwork and some graduate. But then this result was found only for whites. Blacks were in the data set and blacks didn't respond at all to an increase in mandatory schooling. So it's a rather confused picture in trying to explain why this happened. But I think the fact that it happened is what's driving uh, the growing inequality in, in our society. It's the combination of a fa failure to, to increase educational attainment of the workforce with this ongoing skill bias technological change to give you an idea how strong this technological change is in our society, since 1998, we've lost one third of manufacturing jobs. Now, uh, you've heard politicians say, we're gonna get those jobs back. Yeah. Well, get them back from where? They didn't go anywhere. In fact, manufacturing output has grown. It's never declined. It keeps growing, but, uh, <coughs> Output per worker has increased so much that, even, that, that we lost one third of, of manufacturing employment without giving up any output. Output today is actually 4% higher than it was in 1998. Now, if, if we, if we um, didn't have China, in fact, if we prevented all imported goods from entering the United States, and goods includes natural resources, and vegetables from Peru and stuff like that. But if we thought of them all imported goods as manufactured goods and we banned them tomorrow, and we assume our manufacturing industry filled the gap, we would still lose 
manufacturing jobs in the United States because that wouldn't be enough to hire all the people who were working in manufacturing in 1998. And that's the force of the technological change. Now, <clears throat> we're falling behind the rest of the world. Uh, this isn't happening everywhere. Uh, the OECD uh, issued a report called Education at a Glance, which I got a copy of. And in that report, we are the only nation in the 30 some odd countries, including all the, all the developed countries, and including China and Russia and, and uh, Estonia and Latvia and uh, quite a few countries. We are the only country in, in, in that data set in which our 55 to 64 year olds are slightly better educated than our 25 to 34 year olds. Every other country has the younger group being m usually much better educated than the older group. We are the only country where that's reversed. Now, it, 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 they, they're almost even, but the 25 to, uh, uh, the 25 to 34 year olds have slightly lower percentage with high school degrees or better uh, than the 64 year olds. And if you work that out, that's all consistent with, with the stopping of the growth of the high school graduation rate. Uh, and by the way, we have the highest uh, um, percentage of 55 to 64 year olds with at least a high school degree of any country in, uh, in, in the data set, the OECD data set. So our 55 to 64 year olds are the best educated but then the rest of the world, you know, with the younger people, they're doing a much better job, and we're back <coughs> on the path. We're, we're at position 11 for 25 to 34 year olds. We're behind Poland, Russia, Slovenia, uh, and of course Canada, Sweden, Finland, and the other guys. So we're sort of falling behind while the rest of the world is moving ahead. And um, it seems to me this is a problem that needs some attention. Um, now, growing income inequality may or may not be a problem, and it really depends on context. Uh, economic growth uh, almost certainly requires uh, some kind of economic in, uh, increasing in income inequality because people invent things, they get rich from it, they get richer than the rest, but then the benefits of that sort of are supposed to spread through society and more and more people find rising incomes using the new technology. Um, but the increased income inequality that we've experienced in the U.S. really can be traced to the failure of lower income households to experience the growth in earnings that the best, better educated households are experiencing. And that makes the uh, increased uh, uh, incomes of the 1% look so uh, uh, extreme. And that's why they can capture a larger and larger share. It's because the rest of society is just about standing still. Well, not all the rest. I mean, uh, people with, with uh, d degrees beyond college are doing pretty well. And it seems to me that this is the problem we should address rather than just focusing on the increased share of the 1%.